Good evening and welcome to the Q&A show. We are live, we're interactive. My name is Cyrus Fernanda and I'm here on Revelation TV every Monday evening at 10 o'clock UK time here to take your questions with a special guest each week to answer your questions. So whatever questions you have, maybe you've got some curiosity or maybe you're reading the Bible, you're not sure quite about the interpretation of the scriptures that you're reading, the certain verses. Maybe you've got some questions about certain characters in the Bible, you want some more information. Well, tonight to answer your questions, we've got Dr. Grady McMurtry on the line. How are you doing? Hey, good evening, sir. How are you? Good. Thank you so much, Grady. Lovely to see you. Uh, you've been uh, on your travels recently, so it's good to see you back home. And I'm glad to be back home. <laughs> Tell us, where have you been? What have you been up to? Oh, my goodness. In the last nine weeks, I've been in uh, North Carolina, Tennessee, Pennsylvania, uh, Virginia, Nevada, Arizona, uh, Maryland, and now I'm back here. Wow. <laughs> I've been, been speaking in, in more churches than that, but in those states. Amazing. And, um, Where do you get the well, energy I, from, I Brady? Where do you get the energy? That's a lot of traveling there. Well, I, I really think that the Lord has, you know, given me the strength to continue the ministry. I mean, I, I could have, I could have retired 10 years ago. Yeah. And just don't have, don't have any interest in it. <laughs> but you got that hunger, isn't it? You got that passion for it, right? Well, that's just it. I, I once had a, uh, a president of a university, Christian university, uh, where I actually got one of my doctorates who, who said, you know, do you have fire in your belly? You know, do you really have that, that interest in the subject that keeps you going? And the answer is yes. Amen. Well, we've got the iPad here. We've got the uh, the questions ready to be read out by our um, from our viewers. You've got the uh, live at revelationtv.com is the email address and the SMS details are also on the screen. But before we go any further, this particular article caught my eye and this is what it's about. Let's see it. Concerns from Christian leaders over artificial intelligence. Christian leaders in the, in the field of science, technology and theology have added their names to an open letter calling for faith and belief communities to be part of the national and international discussion around artificial intelligence. 30 faith and belief leaders took part in a meeting which was hosted by Google. They are looking to launch a new UK-based AI for Faith and Civil Society Commission with the aim of harnessing the opportunities of artificial intelligence for human flourishing while protecting communities from potential harm. They warn that the implications of AI will raise significant ethical and arguably exist existential questions that demand our collective attention and that there is clearly a risk that short-term commercial and economic interests will outweigh long-term social and ethical concerns if we do not find ways to engage a wide range of religious. So let me ask you this, Dr. Grady. This is the concerns from Christian leaders. We've recently seen uh, an AI summit, artificial intelligence summit, hosted by Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, attended by Tesla and technology founder and owner of X. Elon Musk, they're also talking about concerns over AI, but why should we be concerned from a Christian perspective? What are your thoughts? Well, I have talked about this subject before with you, and AI is nothing really except we have reached a point where our computers are so fast and so large and so interconnected that it gives a massive calculation power to machines. And because of that, and the access to information that a single human being could not have altogether, uh, we're simply able to process and to actually formulate algorithms that would make it appear that machines could talk or think and so forth. And that's not true. Um, even AI, which I think is an unfortunate name, uh, is really not intelligent. It's simply Bruce, brute force calculating. That's about what it adds up to. Um, but AI, as it's called now, has tremendous value to humanity, and it can also do tremendous destruction mm -hmm. uh, because you can benefit society. I mentioned uh, previously, for instance, that artificial intelligence has already proven that it can benefit us from a standpoint of health, 
It can make uh, detections of, uh, since say, breast cancer uh, faster and earlier than the best human uh, because it can see these little patterns that we don't even pick up. On the other hand, it can be weaponized. It's the same thing as, as politics, economics, even religion. They, it can be used for great good, and it can also be used for great harm. I'm just thinking of the certain applications out there, ChatGPT, for example, or the uh, the AI AI pieces of uh, apps or software available that people are asking these questions into the AI and they're giving them answers and they're actually believing these are the correct answers. Whereas you ask AI certain questions about God or religion or anything like that, and there's no real concrete knowledge there or, or substance there. The concern is people rely on AI to get their information. Maybe they've got questions about Jesus Christ, their faith or Christianity. They're going to AI. They're not getting the actual answers that we, they should be getting, for example. What do you think? Yeah, well, that's just it. They're not getting human answers. Yeah. They, they, AI is capable of knowing what your background is. It is capable of calculating. And, and again, this is nothing but an algorithm written by a human being. And it can even determine uh, by your background, it knows your purchasing habits, it knows your travel habits, and it literally does know your navigation. And therefore, whether you go to church or not, or whether you go to a synagogue, it, it can actually know that in terms of it being in the database. And therefore, it can give you answers tailored to a particular religion, or it might be tailored against a particular religion. The fact of the matter is what hurts me when I see this is people who are lonely and using chat GBT to, to be a friend. Yes. Uh, some of them, some of them even going to the, and I hate to say this, the point of, oh, I want to marry my computer. You know, yeah. after all, there was a, uh, there was a woman in Hong Kong a few years ago that married her cat. Well, this is the logical consequence of following that, you know, idea. But now you can actually marry a, somebody who's literally a virtual human being tailored to be what you want, but how how utterly desperate is that? There was somebody actually who tried to assassinate the King King Charles, I believe, as well, and they asked him why did you do it, and he said because my Chat GPT girlfriend told me to do it as well. So it's uh, it's a little bit of danger. I think we need to slow this technology down. But from a as Christian perspective, what can we do? What could be uh, what could be the potential solutions from a Christian perspective? What do you think? Well, well, first of all, I, I want somebody to say you'll never slow it down. I, I don't care what group uh, or groups of people uh, say, oh, well, we're going to slow down for six months. You may, but everybody else is going to keep right on going. So the idea of slowing it down is ridiculous. So what is the solution? It's not going to happen. In terms of the solution, it's like any other technology. I mean, after all, think about it. Uh, there was a time when we didn't have TV. There was a time when we didn't have radio. Yeah. And what happened? Well, we developed these things, and they have led to tremendous good, but they also led to tremendous harm. Um, you know, when you think about it, radar uh, developed, particularly in the UK, um, was based on radios, uh, which were developed er much earlier. But we found out that you could actually sense a bouncing signal from a radio. Then we have radar screens. And so what happens? We can defend ourselves as the ba Battle of Britain, um, but we can also use it to seek targets and destroy. So you've got both a defensive and an offensive right there. So again, it, it's not the ethics of the machine or the ethics of the, the algorithm. It's the ethics of the people that use it that's the problem. And therefore, what we need, of course, are people to be saved and use God's ethics Amen. in utilizing this kind of technology. Amen. Thank you so much for those thoughts. Emails are coming in, Dr. Grady. This one's from John. Good evening, John. Uh, good evening, everyone. Please, can you pl explain if Adam was born again, again after the fall? I understand he died spiritually, but he did not have amnesia and believed he was created by God. I also understand that his fall was also unique compared to us. Was he born again after he initially fell? Any scriptures would be more than welcome. Thanks from John. You know, the Bible doesn't say absolutely, but there's every reason to believe that he was saved and Eve too, because God taught him how to do the burnt offering. You know, they made vegetable clothing for themselves, trying to hide their, their nakedness, as it says. 
But uh, we could have a long sermon on that. But the fact of the matter is, God then confronts them. Who have you been listening to? You know, you, I told I told you to do this. You didn't. You did something else. So who are you listening to? And that brings the the conviction that they have sinned. Now, God taught them to do the burnt offering. Taught Adam how to do it. And Adam taught faithful men in a sequence after him down to Noah, who gave the burnt offering after the flood. And the burnt offering is total and complete consecration to God. So if Adam gave it, it would indicate to us, without saying it directly, that he did experience salvation and repentance from his sin. Um, so the same thing with Eve. Now, we know that there were others in their line who chose not to repent. And, of course, they were destroyed by the flood. The descendants didn't. And that only eight people came through the flood as righteous. And then it starts over again. And it only took 150 years to go right back to the Tower of Babel. Okay, this next one here is from Eddie from Birmingham. Hi, Eddie. Hi, Dr. Grady. Professor William Lane Craig says the Bible does not teach a young earth. And he also says young earth believing Christians are doing enormous harm to Christianity. How would you reply to your fellow believer? Unfortunately, uh, William Lane Craig has gone off the farm. Uh, if you take a look at many of his other writings, um, he is a disciple of Norman Geisler. The two of them have come up with some very aberrant theology in recent years. At first, they were fine. Uh, we can disagree about the age of the earth, but uh, the fact of the matter is that some of his teachings now have gone so far afield that one even wonders if they're within Christianity uh, as orthodoxy. Um, yes, I'm a young earther, and he doesn't believe in a young earth. He has made a compromise with evolutionary time. And I hate to say this, he, he's even written that, you know, people like myself, in, uh, I'm not quoting, but he's suggesting we have a hole in our head big enough to drive a Mack truck through. Uh, the fact of the matter is, no, we simply have a high regard for biblical inerrancy and a high regard for the science that proves that evolution is not true. This next one here is from uh, Jean and Joan from uh, Kent. Hi there. Uh, this one's saying, good evening to you. Uh, my question is, in your opinion, why didn't Israel choose to just use undercover personnel to take out Hamas to avoid the outright bombing? After all, they know, uh, they know the whereabouts of Hamas from intelligence and from media confirmation of, to the world. Perhaps Israel would not be condemned as much by the war of the mounting death toll. Also, another interesting point my mother observes, in World War II, we did not hear chance to stop attacking Germany when Hitler was a perpetrator of that war. We do support Israel and our, and our prayers go out to the innocent victims in this conflict. Thank you from Jean and Joan. Well, I'm not exactly sure the question that they really want answered, but I would point out that Hamas used not only traditional warfare, but absolute uh, barbaric behavior. And Israel has every right to do exactly what it's doing now. I support them fully in it. Uh, I would point out that many people are saying, well, all these innocents are being killed. Well, the first 1,400 innocents killed were Jews. In addition to that, if we take a look at history, war has always been like this. It's amazing how people forget, even in a matter of 10 or 20 years, past histories. But please tell me, uh, we dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, Nagasaki. Um, we were participants with the Allies in the firebombing of Tokyo, but also the firebombing of Dresden. Um, these were terrible acts, but necessary in order to win a war against somebody who was going to relentlessly continue to try to kill us. You know, there's people are forgetting something. I, I just wrote in my last newsletter, and will write in my next newsletter, um, that there is such a thing as righteous war. Um, Christians have developed the, the doctrines of righteous war, uh, starting, first of all, with the first century writings of the apostles and the rest of the Bible, but also by Augustine and others, uh, that the single highest calling uh, that we have when it comes to our culture is to protect innocent life. 
If it's necessary to kill enemy soldiers to protect innocent life, then that's what we must do. What do you see from the portrayal of the media of saying like Israel are savages, they're ruthless and they're killing innocent lives on purpose, they're bombing the hospitals and such things. Obviously, we know from the missile attack that happened, it was actually one of their own Hamas rockets that um, blew up some of that hospital as well some time ago. But how do you make it of Israel are ruthless in that way? Israel are kind-hearted people, even soldiers and also Netanyahu. And there's some footage as well of, of them trying to supp provide supplies of fuel and petrol as well so their uh, generators can keep going on uh, using in the hospitals and such things. But the way that the media is portraying Israel is very much on an evil slant. What do you make out of all of that? Well, I think the media that does so is quite wrong, obviously. Uh, first of all, Hamas even shoot their own people to prevent them from escaping, to use them as human shields. They build tunnels and headquarters buildings underneath hospitals because they think that we would not attack them. And, and I think the Jews have used extraordinary restraint, yeah. uh, frankly, uh, when it comes to trying not to have the, the, the civilian population suffer other than having to leave. I mean, they really have taken extraordinary measures. I don't think they get any credit for that. But it's Hamas who builds under a hospital and begs you to bomb the hospital so that they'll look like some kind of hero. The fact of the matter is they're the worst of the worst. How can we compare the war that's taking place right now in Israel to the war that's taking place in Ukraine? Because obviously now we're hearing obviously about the what's going on in Israel. We don't hear anything about Ukraine, but it's obviously still ongoing. But how would you compare the both? Uh, my my differentiation is this. Israel and Hamas is a religious war. Mm. That is not what's going on in the Ukraine. In the mm. Ukraine, we're talking about a political and economic war. Mm. It's quite different. Uh, the objectives of the leaders is quite different. I mean, there are those leaders who are trying to simply defend themselves and simply keep their own land. Mm. On the other hand, there are those who are trying to conquer them and take what, what they have. But there's a big difference between a religious war like we have in Israel with Hamas, and it is a religious war. There's no question about that. And something that is a political economic war, which is Russia with Ukraine. Very, very interesting. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Alwyn in, in South Wales has written, hi, great show, great answers as always. Um, can you please tell me what the Bible says about certain meats we can't eat? Is web feet foul? Okay. Also... Uh, p black put, uh, pudding. I'd like your opinion on this. Thank you. And that's from Alwyn. <laughs> well, that depends on your opinion about whether we're talking about Old or New Testament, too, because um, I would, <laughs> sorry, I have to tell you, I, I would not recommend eating food made from blood. I'll leave it at that. Um, but we also have the experience um, in Yofa with the sheet coming down with the many animals on there. And what God has blessed, don't reject. So that we are no longer living strictly by the kosher laws of the Old Testament. And we have, as I like to point out, because, you know, I'm a New Testament Christian, um, that I'm, I'm very grateful for Genesis 9-3, where God modified the original food laws and said, now you shall eat meat, as you know, because we've had food together. Um, but in the New Testament, um, he's, he's saying whatever God has blessed. If you, if you eat with faith, having prayed over it and asking God's blessing upon it, um, we would have the spiritual reason to say that we can eat these creatures. Um, but I always go back to the point that what you eat and uh, is strictly a matter of personal conviction. Uh, that if you wish to be a vegetarian, as long as you supplement it with animal proteins, what you need, uh, then fine. But if your conviction is that you can eat meats, that's fine. I do not recommend eating organ meats, nor do I recommend eating anything that has, uh, as its base, blood, uh, simply because there's too many possibilities of acquiring things that you would not want to have. Mm, very interesting.
This next one here is from Chris, our good friend Chris in Penzance. Uh, just talking about the remembrance of our war cell, uh, of our veterans, dear Grady, uh, with all those paying respects for our fallen as mainly a military event, which includes a non-political one. As peace failed to be met around negotiating tables between two nations in which ultimately one would declare war on another. The question one. Do you agree that as the love of God encompasses both sides, that God does not take sides who wins the war? God takes the side of the righteous, but it isn't that he's taking sides of the people. For instance, uh, our civil war, you know, we, we had people in the north and the south. Both of them were Christian. Unfortunately, some of them in the south had a, an inerrant and an errant view of some of the scriptures, but regardless of which, they both prayed to the same God. And I can show you quotations where they said, if you really want to stop this civil war, let's just sit down and reason together. Mm. Um, so the fact of the matter is, 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 you know, when you cheer for your team in a stadium, do not cheer for God to give you a victory, uh, simply because it's your team. <laughs> The fact of the matter is uh, that God loves us all. We are all capable of experiencing salvation, but only those that accept that gift of salvation will receive it. The second part. What's of the, the second question? Yeah. The second question is this: uh, May I also ask that is the is it the government that informs the military to participate participate them into battle? Well, first of all, that depends on the country you're in. In the United States, constitutionally, our military is subservient to the civilian leadership. That, so the, the military in the United States cannot take military action without the approval of our political structure. But in another country where the military has had, a, say, a junta, and the military is now the government, then, of course, the military decides. But it depends on what country you're in and what's the political state of it. Albert in Perth in Scotland has written in. Dear Cyrus and Grady, greetings to you in the name of Jesus. May I ask Dr. Grady if he would comment on whether the scriptures have any clear guidance on whether a believer should be only buried or is there in any argument to stop a believer from choosing cremation? And that's from Albert. Well, hi, Albert. By the way, I enjoy Perth. I've uh, been there before. Um, in terms of burial or cremation, we have not had that question in quite a while, but we've certainly talked about it before. Now, again, I say it's a conviction of the individual that should be taken into account. The important thing is that we always treat the body with respect. So after death, wash, cleaned, um, proper memorial service. Uh, however, whether the body is buried or whether it is cremated, makes no difference at all to God, as long as, again, the body has been respected after death. Because think with me, what happens in the ground is no different than what happens in the crematory. It just takes a longer time. We recently had the Remembrance uh, Weekend, uh, Grady, in London, where there were pro-Palestine um, uh, protests going on and marches throughout the London, 300 to 500,000 people uh, some of the violent clashes as well. I don't know if you heard about that. Are you familiar with that, Grady? Yes, and unfortunately witnessed it in the sense of the videos. Uh, of course, I'm pro-Israel, and I hated that idea. What really bothered me a lot was two things. One, that they would do this on our Armistice Day. Yeah. Uh, I thought that was a great disrespect to the nation that supposedly these people are living in. Yeah. And theoretically, many of them citizens. Um, the other thing was that, to me, it was mind-boggling to see Christian England with a half a million protesters that are in favor of Hamas, uh, many of them uh, thinking that it was a good idea. But the fact of the matter is, many of them in that protest, if they were to go to Gaza or Syria or Saudi Arabia or Iran, would be immediately killed. 
Well, this viewer has written in, there's no particular name on this, but they've sent a message here. It says, shame on the UK for allowing those protests in central London on Remembrance Weekend. Police doing nothing to stop the Palestinian uh, causing from trouble. Seems to me, oh, seems you can wave a Palestinian flag in London, but raise a Union Jack and you can be handcuffed and stuffed into a cell. Those protesters who disrespected Remembrance Weekend should be uh, also leave the country and banned from ever returning this country. If they ho if they hold a British passport, citizens should be removed. Um, Hamas terrorists are not needed in this country. Also, as a clo and we should close our borders, close everything that is going on around. Um, it's an interesting one. That's obviously the views of that Pacific viewer, but that is a concern as well because. I'm just thinking of going to the Islamic countries, going to Saudi Arabia, for example, and marching and such things again on Christian values. I'm sure that government wouldn't tolerate that, would you? They wouldn't tolerate it for a second. Uh, the fact of the matter is that Christians sow the seed of their own demise, that we are tolerant of people. We don't force them to become believers. The second thing is that both in the EU and in the United States, uh, there has been a huge mistake of allowing uh, illegal aliens to come into the land from many different faiths and backgrounds, uh, including terrorists. I mean, the number we have already caught uh, is about one-tenth of the number that have actually come into the country. But we've caught about 160 you know, flat-out terrorists coming over the border, probably 1,600 have. And the number of cells that we have in our states now is probably one, two, three hundred terrorist cells. But we sow the seeds of our own destruction through tolerance, uh, that, that we allow people to come. And if they will not change their religious views to that of Christians, we simply allow them to stay. Well, ultimately, that causes a cancer in the land. Think about what happened with the story of Joshua when he leads the people into the promised land. Um, God instructed them to tell the people to voluntarily leave. It was not genocide. Uh, but if they would not voluntarily leave, it was not their land to begin with, um, that they could then be killed. And then, of course, the Jews allowed themselves to be tricked into a couple of situations where that cancer did remain in the land. And what happened? It caused the nation to go downhill. Where does this all go down to? Is it our political leaders? Is it our prime minister? Is it a president? Is it the national party? Is it the political party? What is, who does this, who's his responsibility go down to, Grady? Well, of course, the responsibility ultimately is individual. I mean, that's, that's the nut of that. But I would like to point out that much of the problem is from the pulpit. Mm. That pastors have not properly taught their congregations the Word of God that they have taught an inappropriate kind of tolerance. Now, we, we don't want to be intolerant of people. We don't want to hurt them. We, we don't want to force them into a belief in Christianity. By the same token, what we have done is that we have not staunchly stood for Christianity and properly um, defended the word in such a way that any, anyone listening would then come to faith. Mm. So it starts with the individual. Then it goes to the pulpit. Yeah. After the pulpit, then it goes to the government that has supposedly been elected as representative of the people. Okay, this one's from Satinda. Thank you, Satinda, for writing in. Greetings to you both in Romans 14, 12. It says, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. The Bible says we are saved by grace through faith alone. So what would be the purpose behind this, please? Blessings from Satinda. Well, first of all, you're talking about the judgment of the believer. And in doing so, that's a determination of what we will be doing and the amount of authority we're going to be having in heaven, because there are various crowns. You know, Paul talks about various crowns, crown of salvation, etc. And in Revelation, it talks about the crowns of the apostles. Um, so there is a difference of reward in heaven, even though everybody that's a Christian gets to go. But there is still, as the story of the master with the talents, um, those with two and obtained two, they were accepted uh, because they did the best they could with what they had. 
but there were also those that had 10, gained 10, and they had a higher level of responsibility in heaven. So there's differences of reward, even though salvation is equal. So I hope that you can see that, Satinda. And, of course, those that go to hell, it's irrelevant. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And I encourage our viewers, maybe you've got further questions you want to ask Grady on some of the answers he's been given, feel free to write in. We've got live at revelationtv.com. SMS details are on screen. We've still got a little bit of time, so try and get your emails in fairly soon. Uh, this next one's from Dave to say hi to you both. Dr. Grady, last week I asked about whether there was more than one planet with intelligent life. You said read Psalm 115. So I did. It says that he gave the human race the earth and the rest was his, was his, but it did not deny the fact that he could have given a planet to some other form of intelligence and still said the rest was his. Is there any other scriptures to prove your point, please? And that is from Dave. Well, Dave, actually, I think I did give some other points. Uh, perhaps you want to go and review that program in the archives. But I not only mentioned Psalm 115, which is absolute. However, there are other scriptures we could think of. For example, Jesus Christ came here and died once for all. Now, God is the only one in the entire universe who can use the word all and mean it. Mm -hmm. And to fulfill God's righteousness, if there were sentient beings like us who could experience sin and salvation, wouldn't Jesus have to go there and die for them as well? And the answer is, that's impossible. Uh, even Paul writes, he says, if you put Jesus to death uh, twice, then his death is of no avail. And so there are the scriptures that reinforce my point. Well, if you do want to go back there, Dave, and watch the video on demand system on our website, just go to revelationtv.com slash videos. You'll see the video on demand. You see Q&A show and you can watch all the past Q&A programs. It's a wonderful evangelical tool as well for your friends and families. And I really encourage you to share the Q&A show, watch them. And uh, there's so much information that we share. And uh, sometimes you want to watch it again in case you missed anything. Uh, Phil from the Wirral has written in. Thank you, Phil, for writing in. Uh, it's asking about Bible contradiction. Please, can you explain why in Galatians chapter 6, Paul in verse 2 says that we should carry each other's burden. Then in verse 5, he said that each one should carry his own load. Thank you from Phil. Well, there's no contradiction there. First of all, we do have to carry our own. That's a responsibility we have before God. Secondly, we're to share with the others to help encourage them, to strengthen them. Uh, those who uh, may feel particularly uh, remorseful, uh, repentant, etc. I mean, there can be a whole bunch of different emotions. But we are to help them and help them carry them. Uh, we're to help them to be counseled. And so we do both. We carry our own, and we can also help the weaker ones amongst us who do need encouragement and counseling. This one's an interesting one, Dr. Grady. It says, welcome, saints of the Lord God. May the Lord bless you all and your loved ones. Would you say if there, is, if there are any evidence for ET life being out there? If a flying saucer appeared on the White House lawn, would that prove or disprove our faith? <laughs> it's a unique question, Grady. What do you think? <laughs> well, it's an interesting mixture, but we just kind of addressed that question. Again, there is no uh, alien life forms, sentient beings like us, intelligent who can experience salvation, death, and even resurrection to be with the Lord in heaven. Not possible. Bible precludes it. Uh, now, remember that the sightings of aliens and UFOs we've talked about many times, 99% are fiction for one reason or another, drugs, water. However, 1% of the people who claim to have seen such things did see something. But what is it? It is simply demonic activity where demons can take the form of alien creatures that appear monstrous to us, not human-like. Uh, for the purposes of deceiving those who want to be willingly deceived. And if they can take the form of, of aliens, they can take the form of UFOs. And so these creatures 
demonic fallen angels can take the form of both aliens and also vehicles, if you wish. Um, but it's only for the purposes of deceiving those who want to be willingly deceived. And um, I was trying to remember the name of that particular movie, but uh, I can't remember from the 1950s when basically that's what was depicted. Michael Rainey uh, played the, the alien. Funny how he looks so human. Interesting. This next one here is asking, uh, it's from Paul. Thank you, Paul, for writing in. Gate in heaven is a subject. It says, hi, Dr. Grady and Sai. This is Paul in Sheffield. There are gates. Uh, there are gates of pearl in heaven. So why does heaven need gates? Interesting well, question. First of all, if you, <laughs> well, first of all, if you, you will, I don't get into eschatological questions, but I can say that uh, when we read the Bible, the New Jerusalem comes down and uh, occupies the place where Jerusalem is today. Now, if that's uh, considered as a building, then how else would you get in? Interesting. Very interesting. This next one here well, is... And, and there, on, sorry. There, but there's other gates, too. You know, but there's other gates, too. I mean, when we worship God, you know, we enter his gates with praise and his courts with thanksgiving. Um, again, these can be both physical and it can be metaphorical. This one's from Bridget, Zechariah 13, 8. Two thirds of the people in the land will be struck down and die, says the Lord, but one third will survive. Good evening, Dr. Grady and Sai. My question is, why will two thirds of the people be struck down in the land of Israel, especially when good had promised had, uh, when God had promised to gather all of the Jews back to their land. I can't understand this. It doesn't seem loving. Please give me your take on this. God bless you from Bridget. Uh, Bridget, I've actually talked about this in a different vein before. Remember that Israel, the state of Israel as it exists today, was not formed as a religious state. It was formed as a socialist state. Uh, a secular socialist state, primarily by people who survived the Holocaust uh, and came to Israel, uh, but had been members of labor unions. And Ben Gurion was the president of a labor union. Uh, so that when God says He's going to bring the Jews back to the land, and He certainly has brought many back to the land, they aren't all saved, <laughs> you know. And so, do not confuse the word Jew with saved. Uh, unless they know Jesus as their Messiah, they won't be saved. Therefore, while there may be many Jews in the land, not all of them are going to go to heaven. Interesting. This next one's from Les Grady. This one's saying, Grady, do you think the church is caught up before, during, or after the tribulation period? And what are your reasons? Well, first of all, I don't take a position on that other than he's coming back and I'm supposed to be working when he comes to get me. After that, it's merely what branch interpretation you choose because I don't do eschatology. I only do foundations. This next one's from Duncan. Duncan saying, hi, sign Dr. Grady. Dr. Grady, when are you coming back to Inverness? I run a men's Christian group and your presentations would just knock them out. Blessing from Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Actually, I was in Inverness in July, but I wasn't speaking. Uh, that was a personal visit. Uh, all I need is a proper invitation. <laughs> so there you go. if you want to get one together, just let me know. You can contact us through our website at creationworldview.org. Uh, there's a place there for people to try to schedule events, and you just fill that out, and we'll start a conversation. There we go. Can we put Grady's website on the screen, please, guys? Uh, there it is, creationworldview.org. really encourage you to go on to Grady's website as well. If you want to search Grady online, Dr. Grady S. McMurtry is the search engine, but the doc, creationworldview.org. So many articles, so much information you're just giving out there for free. And, uh, and also your contact details, I assume, are on there as well, Grady. Am I right? Yes, sir. That's right. Excellent. Wonderful. There you go, Duncan. We'd love to come back to Inverness. <laughs> oh, excellent. Uh, this next one here is saying, hi there. Can you please ask Dr. Grady, will the innocent Muslims have their lot... Uh, 
lots that have lost their lives in this war that did not have war in their hearts, will they have a chance to go and be with the Lord Jesus in heaven? Interesting question. Um, well, but unfortunately, the answer is no. Um, because even though there are Muslims who are not violent, uh, that would like to live in peace with people, uh, they still uh, believe in a religion uh, that is other than Christianity and therefore cannot accept Christ as Lord and Savior. They accept him as a prophet, a minor prophet, but they do not accept him as Lord and Savior. And if they don't accept him as Lord and Savior, they will not go to heaven. Okay, this next one here, the email's coming a little bit backwards. I'm going to try and see if I can uh, uh, understand this correctly. It says, Dr. Grady, as a Christian, how do you counter... Uh, we are products of our environment regarding faith put by psychiatrists. Okay, well, that idea that we are the product of our environment came primarily from B.F. Skinner, uh, a signer of the first humanist manifesto, uh, therefore basically an atheist and an evolutionist. And so he was saying that we are simply animals who are somehow or another controlled by our environment, uh, which is simply a false concept. We are not animals. Uh, we are human beings. There's a distinct difference because while animals have a soul and a body, they do not have a spirit. And so it has been proven more than once, and I'll put it in the millions of times, that you are not the product of your environment if you choose not to be. This next one's from Les, our good friend Les. Thanks for writing in, Les. Also, uh, asking this: How would an evolu evolu evolutionist <laughs> explain how a mixture of lifeless chemicals spontaneously organize themselves into the first living cell? Well, that's just it. They cannot. Um, there has never been a biologist or a microbiologist that has ever been able to explain how even the simplest of uh, biological forms that have come into existence by random chance. Uh, first of all, you have to believe by faith that the building blocks came into existence by random chance, somehow or another, that matter and energy could come from nothing. And then you have to believe that they could organize into more and more complex organisms. But no chemist, no microchemist, no microbiologist, etc., has ever come up with a, an answer. Now, they've come up with fairy tales for adults, They've all been disproven. And even Miller, um, who was part of the Miller Erie experiment back in the 50s, uh, died uh, saying that it was impossible. Uh, he had tried it from the DNA standpoint and then from the RNA standpoint, and he said it simply can't happen. Our good friend Chris in Penzance has written as well. When our armed forces are fighting on the, on the field when killing an, an enemy, is it deemed a murder rather than if a common criminal premeditating a murder upon another? Well, again, no. And there are people who use Bible translations that look at the Ten Commandments where it says, thou shalt not murder or thou shalt not kill. Yep. Now, with that in mind, I said earlier in the program that the single highest, the apex of Christianity is the protection of innocent life. And therefore, uh, when a soldier kills a soldier at 100 yards with a rifle or at 1,000 yards with, with a mortar, um, it's not personal. You know, you're, you're protecting innocent life by killing that soldier, but you don't know him. You don't have any personal animosity against him. What you have animosity against is his ideology. What is he fighting for? And so that, that's not murder. Murder is when you intentionally say, I don't like you, you're in my way, and because evolution says that uh, survival of the fittest and uh, that sort of nonsense, uh, but I believe it, uh, then I have a right to blow you away. You know, you've done something to personally offend me. But that's not what happens in war. That's not what happens on the battlefield. Uh, when soldiers kill other soldiers at a distance, it's not personal, and it's not murder. It is killing but it's not murder. Les has written in asking about DNA. What is the evolutionist response to? How could the DNA coding system arise without being created? Well, again, evolutionists cannot answer that question. 
Uh, they cannot answer how the laws of genetics work. And again, they are laws in nature. Uh, they cannot explain the complexity of life. They cannot explain, for instance, the chemical sequences that are involved. Uh, it is staggering to any chemist, microchemist, to look at the sequence of events, for instance, just the chemical reaction chain uh, that initiates a human birth or the coagulation of blood. And I would point out the stopping of the coagulation of blood uh, or how a bombardier beetle came up with uh, the complexity of its defensive mechanism. It's impossible. The, the greatest chemists in the world couldn't have come up with it initially on their own. Only the world's greatest chemist, that's God, could have put these things into, into existence. And I would point out that genetics is not simple at all. Uh, we have genes that are not simply controlling one thing, but can, in fact, uh, make five different proteins and do it on demand. What tells it to do that? We now know there's at least three levels of intelligence in the DNA. That's an impossibility to come about by random chance. And evolutionists believe in evolution because it's a religion, but it's anti-science. Gene is written in saying, good evening. Israel and the Jewish people are peaceful and quiet. In World War II, the Jewish community did not start anything. And just now they were attacked by Hamas. What do people of the world expect Israel to do? Stand by and simply let these evil attacks happen? No, Israel is correct to stand up and defend itself and its people. Would the UK stand by and allow, what, allow it to happen to them? I hope not. The USA, after 9-11, went after the terrorists, and rightly so. If a country doesn't defend itself or people, then the governments of that particular country have no regard for the nation's safety or people. God will, divine, will divinely guard and lead Israel. God is Israel's keeper, and he will surely do it. Blessings to you all from Jean. Great comments there, Gene. What do you think, Grady? Well, I'll say amen to the comments. And again, if Germany had continued to bomb London, would you have uh, said, oh, well, we'll just talk about it and have peace? I don't think so. Uh, the fact of the matter is that when you're attacked, again, you have to defend your borders and you have to defend your people. And when your politicians will not defend your people, then you need to change politicians. This next one here is saying hi there. Uh, it's Stephen. Can you please ask Dr. Grady, does he think that Israel should just put troops on the ground to get rid of Hamas and stop bombing Gaza to save innocent lives being lost? God bless you all at Revelation TV. Well, innocent lives would be prevented from being lost if Hamas wasn't using them as human shields. Yeah. Uh, the fact of the matter is Hamas is killing the Palestinians. Uh, they're using the Jews perhaps to do it in places, but even Hamas has killed their own people specifically for the purposes of promoting the cause, their ideology that they have. Um, and, and so, I, again, I think Israel has taken extraordinary measures to try to, to prevent collateral damage. But in war, you will always get collateral damage. This one's written in, uh, this is Pamela Grady. You were asking about the film. And uh, the name of the film was The Day the Earth Stood Still. Thank you. And as soon as you said it, I knew you are right. <laughs> Very good. Thank you so much, Pamela, for but being on the But I remember Michael Rainey. I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> That's not bad. Not bad. 50% of the way. Not bad. We'll give you a grade B, Grady. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, Les has written in to say, can you please explain biochemical pathways and multicellular life? Well, again, that's a very interesting question. First of all, I couldn't possibly explain it all on this program, and that's not what this program is all about. But biochemistry proves that evolution is not true and that creation is. Um, secondly, I would also just kind of interject because of the way the question was asked. Um, we find single-celled life today all over the world. Uh, we do find organisms that consist of two cells working together. Uh, we find organisms consisting of six cells or more working together as a multiple cellular organism, though obviously starting very small. So you tell me, why are there no three, four, five cell creatures? 
We've never found one. But if evolution is true, shouldn't we have gone from two to three to four to five to six to seven to eight? I mean, wouldn't that seem logical? And yet there's a gap between one and two and six and up. Wow, very interesting indeed. Edwards written in saying, what is meant in Psalm 69 by the phrase, save me, O God, mighty God of the sun, goodness of our orchids, accept our sacrifice and make our blossoms fruit. What does this mean, Psalm 69? Well, again, uh, if you would, I'm going to ask Sai to read it one more time. No problem. Here we go. Psalm 69. Save me, O God, mighty God of the sun, goddess of our orchids, accept our sacrifice and make our blossoms fruit. Now, doesn't that simply show an appeal to salvation? Mm. You know, the, the one who created the sun, the one who created the orchids, etc., uh, he's the one who made us, and he's the one who gave us a plan of salvation. And if we accept that plan of salvation, we'll be with him in eternity future. So it's an appeal to the creator God who, who made us and all these other things and has the power to give us salvation with him and provide that plan and is willing to die for us and not us for him. Wow. This one's from Glenda. Hi, Dr. Grady. How do Christians go about doing spiritual warfare? God bless from Glenda. Well, the first thing in spiritual warfare is, of course, we think of prayer. But I would take you to 2 Corinthians, first of all, chapter 11, where Paul talks about spiritual warfare. Now, most people think of Ephesians. Most people think about putting on the helmet of salvation and then the sword of the Spirit, etc. And believe me, I think Ephesians is incredibly important when it comes to spiritual warfare and that these things are, such as there's the helmet of salvation is to protect our mind from incorrect thoughts being placed there by Satan, the sword of the Spirit to, to be on the attack, not on the defense. There's no protection of the back in Ephesians. We're to be moving forward, never to be retreating. But, but I want to point out that if we go to, again, 2 Corinthians 11, uh, Paul says, what is he worried about? What concerns him the most? And he says, it's your mind. And the Bible is not written in the order that you and I would write it if we were writing the Bible. And so sometimes in order to get the best understanding, you have to read it out of order. So in 11, Paul talks about his concern is for your mind, uh, lest your mind be led astray, right? Mm -hmm. If we go back to chapter 10, then we have this uh, spiritual warfare concept of, you know, we do not battle in flesh and blood. It's not carnal, but it's made to bringing down of strongholds. Well, that's satanic fortresses. And we are to take every thought captive. Well, that's every thought, every device of the mind. Um, and so what he talks about there is that while there is 50% of warfare that is to pray uh, and to, again, prepare ourselves properly for warfare, with the spirit by the same token it's our mind that's the other half so the spiritual warfare is 50 percent supernatural but it's also 50 percent intellectual and so if you have your mind right you'll do a lot less spiritual warfare to begin with and you will not allow satan's thoughts to come and influence you wow amen i'd love to use this opportunity to just pray for our viewers dear heavenly father all our viewers there are watching us today. Our Lord, just please bless their lives. You know the situation's going on in their lives. And I pray that you can just bless them, each and every single one of them. You bless their family. You bless the people around them. You know the circumstances, whether it's a financial situation. And let them draw closer to you. Maybe they're going through a health situation. Maybe they're going for a family issue. Whatever the problem is, whatever the issue is, stay close to them. Protect them. No weapons formed against them shall prosper. And when two or more are gathered in, in your name, Lord, People are healed in Jesus' name. We just pray that for every single one of our viewers watching us tonight. Thank you, Dr. Grady. Now, Dr. Grady, just quickly Amen. do some more uh, questions before we finish. Mark has written in, say, how many, uh, how many years ago were dinosaurs, cavemen, and ice age? I can't believe it was within 6,000 years. And that's from Mark. 
Oh, it absolutely was. Dinosaurs are created on day five and day six of the week of creation. Uh, I shouldn't say day five. It's other reptiles we consider to be from the same period as the dinosaurs, but the flying reptiles, the aquatic reptiles. Um, but they were created, and dinosaurs that are terrestrial were created on the same day as Adam and Eve, lived together until the time of the flood. Now, there was one ice age that occurred after the flood. It is mentioned in the Bible, uh, particularly in the book of Job, in a couple of chapters where it mentions the first um, ice and snow in the Bible. And that's uh, Job being roughly 350 years after the flood. Uh, but the ice age lasted roughly, in our best estimate, 700 years. Um, but there was one ice age after the flood. Um, and, and I just don't see why you couldn't accept that, uh, both scientifically and biblically, because it's there. This will last one here quickly, if we can get it in. God is love and Jesus is the Prince of Peace. They have not gone to hell. Look for Jesus with your whole heart and you'll find him. And that is how you read, you read the Bible and it's not all true. Are you that scared of this question? You're cold, right? Wing and callous. I am Jesus' bride just for me. You need to think love. God is love. Amen. That's a beautiful way to end tonight's program. God is love, despite what is going on in this world today. Dr. Grady McMurtry, thank you so much. As always, your website is creationworldview.org. I encourage our viewers to go and check it out. God bless you, Grady. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And thank you to all our viewers. Thank you for your interaction. Don't forget, we've got a video on demand system on our website. Just go on to revelationtv.com slash videos and you can see all our programs again. Use it as an evangelical tool and share this program with your friends and family. Just go on to Revelation TV and you've got all the catch up service also of Revelation TV programs. No matter what you're going through in your life, I pray that you have some light in your darkness. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Take care. God bless. See you next Monday live at 10 o'clock UK time. Bye bye.